Well, good morning. So there's two words I want you to remember from Daniel chapter 6. This is the most familiar story in the book of Daniel. I want you to remember these two words, faithful servant. I want you to remember it for Daniel, and then I want to ask you to ask God to do that in you. Now, real quick, we missed an announcement this morning, so I'm going to make sure I do it. Uh, ladies Bible study this Thursday at 6 p.m. right next door. And let it go is the theme. Is that right? Let it go? Like frozen? Let it go? Let it go? Okay. It's by Karen Amen. Is that how you say your name? I like a name that sounds like Amen. Karen Amen. Anyway, great to see you guys this morning. I want to throw that out there. Today we're going to talk about the three lions we all must face. Because here's what I know. You read an Old Testament story. You read the story of Daniel. And you kind of like throw it into the, it's like thousands of years old. So you're like, well, you know, I'm not going to face a lion or a tiger or a bear. And some of you have faced, have you ever faced a bear in the woods or a lion or a tiger? Come on, Carl. I know you have. You have it. How many of you faced an alligator? Anybody faced an alligator? Okay, there we go. All right. So um, Carl told me a story this morning. That was great. So today, though, I want to talk about three lions we all must face. But I want to talk about how sometimes, you know, we look at this story and we see Daniel, lion's den, that whole deal. And we think this doesn't relate to me at all. So I want to show you three things that Daniel faced way before the lion's den. And there are three things that you face and I face, whether we go to work, whether we deal with our neighbors, when we deal with our family, when we even deal with our church life, whether it's serving at church or doing what God wants us to do. Anytime you're called to do what God wants you to do, you're going to deal with these three things. Now, years ago, I learned something that I never knew, which I thought was hilarious. My sister Kelly, my mom, uh, uh, my sisters had rooms next to each other and my mom would bring the vacuum cleaner and she would, uh, you know, leave it in the hallway and say, Let, girls, you need to vacuum your rooms today. And then uh, one time my sister said, my mom came into her room, my sister Kelly, and said to her, Kelly, listen to that. Why can't you be like your sister Tracy when you vacuum? Now, what my mother didn't know was that Kelly would vacuum her room very quickly, be done, and give the vacuum to Tracy. Then Tracy would take the vacuum in her room, turn it on, and get on the phone with her friends. And my mother thought that meant she was vacuuming better than my sister Kelly. Now, what do I mean by that? By the way, my mom's watching online, so I'm really looking forward to the comments that she's going to post about this story. Because I'm not sure that she knew this until just now. But here's what's funny. You can fool people and pretend that you are faithful. You can pretend that you're a good Christian. You can pretend that you love people. But God really knows whether you're a faithful servant or not. So even though you may not face real lions, some of you are facing like that coach discouragement. Do I quit? And by the way, it's usually things that matter that you're going to get discouraged about. OK, and, and so if you're helping, if you're helping on the praise team and and somebody says the wrong thing to you, you what are you going to do? You're going to get offended. And oh, I forget this. I'll never forget greeters at the door who somebody said, could you close the door one day? And they said, we're never helping here again. People get offended over the least thing when what they do matters. I mean, you can't keep people out of a Miami Dolphins football game, and we've watched them for years. There are people that still go to the stadium, even though the week before somebody spilled beer on them. You get somebody that comes to church, and they get the least little aggravated, and they go, forget it. Why? Because the enemy knows that you being involved with other believers and encouraging people and being faithful to what God's called you to do is going to matter. So he's going to discourage you more about the things that matter than the things you don't. But cat lovers unite. That was great, Rodney. Cat lovers loved your illustration. God is that tree. And so pay attention to what the enemy's trying to do. The three lines we're going to talk about today is this idea of are you really working for God or for yourself or for a boss? Are you obeying and trusting God? And then finally, this the whole idea is, uh, that we're going to talk about today is are you 
a faithful servant. All right, so here's the first test, the first question, the first lion. Will I work for God in all circumstances? And we're going to get to chapter 6 in a minute. I encourage you to read that. Daniel, in chapter 6, is probably about 80 years old. He's been through several foreign leaders. If you remember, Daniel was taken captive from Jerusalem with his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? And he walks up, and you've seen the pictures of a recreation of that front part of the blue wall that they walk through, and the lions and the, the, uh, the other serpent creatures that they walked a mile through to a huge blue wall into Babylon. Daniel went through all of that. He went under different kings, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you need to know this about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar left Jerusalem for a while, but after, I think it was 15 years or so, there were two rebellions. And so Nebuchadnezzar went and wiped out Jerusalem. So by this time, Jerusalem is just a pile of rocks, a pile of buildings that have been destroyed and flattened. And yet Daniel knows that God is still real. He is a faithful servant in the middle of this. Daniel 6, verse 3 through 5. And, and by the way, 1 and 2 talks about how there were 120 satraps. Basically, uh, um, uh, the new king, Darius, set up these 120 leaders. And then there were three people put over these guys. And Daniel was one of those top three people. So, so I guess, you know, I don't know if he's considered a vice president or CEO or CF. I don't know. Your charts are all different. So here it is. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps. And if you want to, you can substitute the word the politicians, right? By his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Not just those three guys. Now, he wants, he, you're going to be over all these people. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to found, find grounds for charges against Daniel in what? In his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. Time out. They did an inquiry to figure out what has Daniel done wrong? Has he bribed anybody? Has he been lazy? Has he been lying to people? Has he been derelict in his duties? Has he been messing around? And they could find... Nothing. Nothing. And then it continues. They can find no corruption in him. Why? Because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt or negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Do you realize what they realized? Daniel was such a good witness. He was such a good, faithful servant to God that it didn't matter who the boss was. Daniel was faithful, so faithful that they knew he was faithful to God. So no matter who came in and who took power, who the new boss was, whether he liked the new boss or hated the new boss, he was just faithful. Why? Because Daniel knows who the real boss is. And it's not the guy who's in charge. It is the king of kings and the Lord of lords that is over all of these guys who come in and tell Daniel what to do. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the show Undercover Boss. Has anybody ever seen that show Undercover Boss? <clears throat> if you haven't seen it, let me just tell you about one episode real quick. And let me get a drink real quick because my throat decided it didn't like this morning. So an undercover boss, one of my favorite ones, is uh, the rotisserie chicken place. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? The place that's, that's up north where Dunkin' Donuts came from. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about yet? It's in some place where they talk about Pak the car in the yard. Boston Market. <clears throat> so the CEO from Boston Market goes to one of the markets to see how people are doing. And goes in there and gets this young guy who is the manager of the whole restaurant. And starts talking to him. And very quickly he starts complaining about the customers. Not a little, but a lot. He even says to her at one point, hey, I'm going to give you a job and let you do it just because I don't want to do it. That's always a good thing to do to your boss. And so he had the boss sweeping in the corner. The one thing and pulling out the tables, the thing he didn't like to do. 
But that wasn't the worst of it. Then he says, I hate our customers, especially the old ones and the kids. They never order, and he just goes on and on. And if you're watching this show, all you can think is, no. Now, sometimes I watch that show, and I'll be honest with you, I look at people and they start to tell their story, and I'm like, oh, you're doing the right, oh, you're working hard, and the boss notices, oh my goodness, if you only knew who you're doing this in front of. By the way, that guy was let go that day. Here's what we don't realize. Your undercover boss is watching all the time. And it's not the boss you see whether you work at NASA or Publix or uh, Dairy Queen. Oh, chocolate covered dipped vanilla ice cream cone. Mmm, amen. amen. <laughs> but that's not your boss. Your boss is not that guy or gal who yelled at you and told you what to do and told you now we've got a new requirement from the top, blah, 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 blah. Your boss is God. And he knows, are you being a faithful servant? But let me tell you something else. Other people know too. Daniel was not just being seen by God. He was being seen by all these other administrators who were jealous of him. And because he was faithful to God, they were irritated and aggravated and could not find a way to get him unless it had to do with God. In Col Colossians 3, 23 and 24, it says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart if you like your boss. Nay, nay. Work at it with all your heart. By the way, that word for heart there means with all your breath. I like that because I used to work construction and I can't tell you the number of times <laughs> after you did something, right? Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Why? Since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you're serving. So just like an undercover boss, God is watching what you're doing and he's the one that rewards it. Not that person you think's the boss that didn't give you the raise, that overlooked that thing, that you were treated the wrong way, you got accused of something you didn't do, all those things... Because the real boss is watching. Daniel knew that. That's why he was a faithful servant in all that he did. Number two, will I obey God and sacrifice? See, one of the things with being a faithful servant is when you do what's right, sometimes you have to sacrifice. But it's just like the scene in Willy Wonka. Do you remember Willy Wonka? And the little boy comes in and he's got the... Evil Grandpa, what's his name? Grandpa who? Grandpa Joe. By the way, Grandpa Joe is evil. If you haven't figured this out yet, Grandpa Joe found enough energy to go and dance at the chocolate factory, but never could get the energy to get out of bed and get a job. I'm just saying, Grandpa Joe is an evil man. And he wasn't any better to Chico and the man. Anyway, so if you have no idea what I'm talking about, kids, Google Google that. All right. So, so at the end of the show, what's happening? Grandpa Joe is saying to him, hey, he's not going to treat you right. You keep that gobstopper and you sell it to the bad guy. But Charlie's so good. What does he do? He takes that gobstopper. He brings it up to the desk and he says, here you go. Little did he know that was the whole test. The test was not all these other things that they went through. The real test was, was he going to be faithful and not sell out to the enemy when the time really came? Hey, the same test is what God puts on us all the time. Are we going to sell out to what the enemy wants us to sell out to? Or are we going to do what God wants us to do at all times? Now, when Daniel, verse 10, learned that the decree had been published. So, so let me give you the in-between. So these politicians, they go, they go to the king and they basically say, Hey, king, uh, I think for the next, you know, 30 days, everybody should just pray to you. Isn't that a great idea? And the king's like, hmm, that's a great idea. Everybody should just pray to me. And he's like, and not only that, anybody who doesn't will be killed. And he's like, that's even a better idea because that'll really motivate them. And then what happens? When Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. So he's looking towards Jerusalem. Why is he doing that? First Kings chapter 8, Solomon 
encourage people to do that. Why? Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit and God's presence resided in the temple. The reason you don't have to face a certain way today is because the New Testament says that the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian, right, resides in you. So you bow your head, right? You, he resides in you. But Daniel was still following what the law said, which was, hey, face Jerusalem. Remember Jerusalem. There was nothing there. And yet he was faithful, a faithful servant. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Now, what happens in a couple of the in-between verses is they reported Daniel. The king realizes that he's been tricked because, remember, Daniel was his favorite. And he's grieving over it. And he tried to figure out a way to save Daniel, but he couldn't. So what, he, what happens next? So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him in the lion's den. Time out. 80 years old, throwing him into a pit? I don't know about you. I, it doesn't sound very nice to me. But it continues. The king said to Daniel, listen, may your God, who you serve continually, rescue you. Time out. What did the king notice? He noticed that Daniel was not a faithful servant to him, but he was a faithful servant to God. Listen, other people will notice when you are a faithful servant to God. You think they're not watching, but can I tell you something? They're watching. One of my favorite things is when somebody says, hey, I met so-and-so from your church, and I'm always like, oh, what's the next line going to be? And it's happened over and over when they say they are the best person to work with or they're a genuine person or they're a real person or I've seen God do something in their lives. And when I hear that one, I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. And people say, how's your church? I go, man, the people are awesome. You got to worry about the pastor. The king says to Daniel, I'm going to go back, your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And then he says, a stone, then it says, a stone was brought, placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation may not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace, spent the night without eating, without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. What does this show? This shows that the king, even though he knew Daniel didn't serve him, but served a greater king, he valued Daniel, he cared. This is a guy who would wipe people out when he just, I mean, somebody would come in and it wouldn't be the right thing and he would just wipe them out. It was like somebody came in, oh, I didn't like that joke, Dave. <laughs> that was it. That would be it, right? And so, and so yet he cared so much about Daniel, what happened? He didn't even turn on the TV. He didn't have anybody. He had access to every type of entertainment and he said, no, I'm not going to eat. I'm, I'm grieving. He was grieving over Daniel. Now, in Romans chapter 13, it talks about how we're supposed to obey government, but we never obey or put government above God's law. How do I know that? Listen, Acts 5, 28 and 29, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. He said, yet you filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And then listen to what Peter says. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. Right now in Afghanistan, right now, right now in Afghanistan, there are church leaders who have been sent letters from the Taliban that say, we are coming for you right now. That's happening right now. In the next few days, you're going to hear about Christian leaders being beheaded for their faith. And yet, they said, we're not leaving. We're here. We're here. Faithful servants. Daniel was a faithful servant. I'm sure he was praying just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My God can save us, but even if he doesn't, I won't serve you. And I'm sure as he was being tied up and brought to the den, he was like, well, God, I know you'll save me any minute. And then as he was being chunked into the den, I don't know, I wonder if he fell on a lion because they talk about him being uninjured. So I can almost imagine him falling on all the lions. <laughs> Oh, plush, soft, very nice, right? I'm guessing if lions aren't biting you, they're pretty, like a big cat, just, hey. Meow. Yeah. And yet he was faithful. I'm sure while he was falling, he was thinking, well, this is it. 
But he knew who he really served, and it was not the guy in front of him who was harassing him. It was the God he knew he had to be a faithful servant. So will I work for God in all circumstances? Will I obey God in sacrifice? Number three, will I trust God to work things out? Anybody in here like puzzles? You put the puzzles on the table. Anybody here like that puzzles? I, I, like, I like doing puzzles. My mom, when we'd go on vacation, a lot of times we'd buy a puzzle. And my mom and I would sit at the puzzle table and we'd work on things. And then every once in a while, what would you do? You kind of zoom in on one piece and you're like, I got to find that piece. And if you're ADD, it is like a challenge for the ages. You are going to find that piece. And sometimes there would be an evil person who would see that piece and take it and hide it. If you had a big family like mine, there's some evil people around, right? But here's the truth. In life, you may be at a place right now where there's a puzzle piece that you don't know the answer to. Maybe the doctor told you something you don't like. Maybe something happened and you're thinking, what's next? Maybe something's going on in your life and you don't have that next piece of the puzzle. And the question is, will I trust God when I don't know where this next piece is going to come from? See, Daniel did that. He didn't know what was next. God didn't give him an advance warning of what was going to happen with the lions. But here's what happened next. He cries out to Daniel. He says to him, Daniel, servant of the living God, who you also worship, did he protect you? Daniel answers, verse 21. May the king live forever. My God sent... I wonder if Daniel paused for just a moment. The king's like, Daniel, did you make it through the night? <laughs> May the king... Live forever. By the way, I'm sure the lion's stomachs were growling because usually before they did this, they would starve the lions, just so you know. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. Time out. So does that mean that Daniel could actually see the angel? Yeah, maybe. Was he having a conversation with Gabriel or Michael? Hey, how's it going? Yeah, you guys doing okay? Yeah, we're doing good. Am I in heaven? Or is this baseball? You know, what is this? That's a little... little the reference to the game this week. Thought I'd... They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Now listen to this next sentence. It's important. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you. Listen. When somebody accuses you falsely, it, do, it does not mean you have to be a doormat and just say, yeah. no, Daniel was glad to say, hey, I never did what they said. That just is not true. And Daniel was okay with standing up for himself and saying to the king, Hey, I never did those things. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him. Why? Because he fell on lions. No, because he had trusted in his God. And by the way, the next uh, sentence, I get questions about all the time. Um, we don't know how many politicians, but the politicians and their whole families we're thrown in the lion's den. That does not seem fair. And so here is the lesson for you, especially if you're young. Listen carefully. Be careful who you marry. There are consequences. Be careful who you marry. Sometimes who you marry will drag you into the pit with them. Did you hear me? Because people are like, well, that's not fair. And I'm like, listen, you make a bad choice and it can pull other people into that choice. We've all, how many of you have seen? You, come on, you know. You've got that friend that married that guy. Come on, you know that one. Oh, been pulled into the pit all the time, right? And then a few verses later, I issue a degree, decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. Why? For he's the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues. He saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He's rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. And the next sentence could just as well say, he lived happily ever after. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. The king saw that Daniel was a faithful servant and saw how God took care of him. And he, the king, did not praise Daniel. He praised the king of kings. He knew who really protected Daniel because he knew that it couldn't just be Daniel. And so Daniel prospered. In the next few weeks, we'll look at different 
uh, prophecies from Daniel. And Daniel, of course, we know was most likely the one who also told the wise men that came to see Jesus. Do you know someone who's an example of Christ? Do you know someone who's a faithful servant that reminds you of Jesus? In Romans 8, 28, it says this, We know that in all things, God works for the good. It doesn't say everything's good, but it says He works for the good of those who love Him, who've been called according to His purpose. So, when you love God and you do what He's called you to do, it, not everything that happens to you is good. But the Bible says He will work those things together for the good. You know, I was trying to figure out how to end my sermon. All week, I was like, I really want a, a story. And then yesterday, I was looking at Facebook, and one of my friends who's a pastor, he posted this. He said, you know, 10 years ago today, we built a building. And when we built the building, the power didn't work right. The water didn't work right. There were people in the church who said, we shouldn't have built a building. We shouldn't have had debt. He said, I was worried about the debt. I was frustrated by the conversation, and I started to think, God, is this where you want me? And he was thinking about quitting. But he said he hung in there and did what God wanted him to do. And here they are 10 years later with a growing congregation that has baptized tons and tons of people. Why? Because my friend was a faithful servant. On the day he felt like quitting, he said, God, what do you want me to do? And so what did he do? He plowed his field when there was no rain. Will you be faithful to God in the dry times, in the hard times, in the difficult times? He's called us to be a faithful servant. You're going to face lions. These may not be the only three. Some of you are facing discouragement today. Some of you are facing depression, maybe grieving, hurting, crying, pain, frustration. And yet, if you'll just be faithful to what God's called you to do today, He will use you so that others... We'll find the way home to him. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you're watching online or you're here. I'd be glad to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to Christ because he died for your sins and rose again. And when you surrender your life to him, we call that making him Lord. The Bible says he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. You don't deserve it, but that's what he does. And then he will give you the power to be a faithful servant on the days you're ready to quit. If you're here today and as a Christian, maybe you're ready to quit in some areas of your life. I want to encourage you, hang in there. Listen, sometimes the enemy will attack in your mind and even use other people to get you discouraged, get you to quit wanting to do what God wants you to do. Hey, you know what you should do? What God wants you to do. So just do that every day and trust him. Be a faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these moments together. We thank you for your word. We can look back at a story from thousands of years ago, and it applies just as much today to our lives. May we be faithful servants of yours every day. Lord, when we go to serve others, remind us that we're really serving you. Lord, when we help others and they don't appreciate it, help us to realize we're serving you. Father, when we help other people and we're attacked, help us to remember that we are serving you in all things. And Lord, I pray if there's one here online that doesn't know you, that today would be the day they surrender to you. Thank you for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen.